talking to vendors, which is like, God, shoot me, right? Talking to vendors and got like, you know, did all these fancy reporting and PowerPoints and I presented to, you know, our executive management uh, and all this stuff and then pretty much said, yeah, right, <laughs> we're not doing that. We can't afford, we can't afford that number. So I started looking and I go to a lot of security conferences and I went to one called BroCon. Anyone, the, anyone here ever been to BroCon or familiar with the Bro Network Security Monitor? See a couple heads nodding, and a couple hands. Okay, so this was, I think, 2014 that I did this, and there was an interesting talk there. Uh, we had dabbled before this with things like Elasticsearch and Solar and different index data stores to, to speed up uh, time series data, you know, essentially data mining and, and asking questions of your data and getting quick responses, right? Um, so, I, so I was at, at BroCon and there was this great presentation. It was from this, this, this guy from uh, Cisco at the time that a product called OpenSock. I thought it was really interesting and I just kind of followed it for a couple years. And eventually, OpenSock turned into an Apache incubating project, which turned into uh, an Apache project, which is kind of the, the path that we went down. We, we ended up choosing that product. And I'll talk about exactly what that product is, but um, that's, that's a bit the, the path that we, that we went. And to give a little bit more background, more specifics about maybe why the numbers were so rough, uh, we were ingesting, um, I'm gonna do this from memory because it's not showing uh, my notes like a nice Mac would. Uh, <laughs> but um, I could probably, whatever. Uh, I, th I think it's something like 600 gigs a day of um, structured information, about 85 terabytes a day of unstructured information. So, you know, whenever you try to shove that in the scene, like, yeah, we're talking millions and millions of dollars, and they said, yeah, that's not happening. So uh, we were able to accomplish that, though, with, a, with just a bunch of hardware and some free and open source software. So, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, so whenever we were talking about this project, uh, I got my boss all excited about it, and so he went out and bought us these awesome TVs to put in our office, because he's like, man, it's gonna be great, we're gonna have sock dashboards, and it's gonna be interactive, and like, we're gonna have an incident, we're all gonna huddle around this big screen, and it's gonna magically tell us like what to do, and how like, it's just gonna fix our problems. So we instantly played the movie Hackers on it, and like, that's all that this thing has done, <laughs> essentially, uh, as far as ascribing any worth to it, right? I, it's great for watching movies. I really enjoy the quality. It's 4K, it's like 50 something inches. It's great for watching movies. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is a funny anecdote. Um, and so, uh, so I was kind of asking myself, you know, you hear this term big data. Everybody's talking about big data. What the hell does big data mean? I mean, different things to different people. So I was, you know, Googling and, you know, I like videos. Videos are fun. So I found this video and it was like, it really like spoke to me and like it really helped me understand what, what big data was. So I just wanted to share it with all of y'all. We turned up over here. where the internet is stored. You know, they got big factories and, you know, clusters of data. It's like totally just like floating around like everywhere. You know, you think about how you used to do business. If you had like 200 phone numbers, you put them in a Rolodex. But nowadays, like, I have 500 phone numbers and I'm not going to get two Rol Rolodexes. <laughs> Computers. I hear it all the time. I, I really, well, I don't really know what it means. Yeah. So that's pretty much what, how the internet helped me. Uh, it made me laugh at least. So, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk about a, a little bit about why now uh, in the context of big data and machine learning and you know, these other related buzzwords, right? So uh, 1956, you kind of have the term of AI and um, there's a lot of you know, philosophical reasons why you would call it maybe AI versus machine learning. Uh, I, I say machine learning because the computers aren't actually intelligent. Um, I would consider AI like artificial and general intelligence, something that you could generalize better. Um, and then in the 1970s, you kind of have expert systems. So expert systems were like, well, let's just take a subject matter expert and shove them into a computer, right? So let's just take everything in their brain and put it in a computer. We'll, we'll make two components out of it, it'll be great. So we'll, we'll take a knowledge base and we'll just like gather all this information from them and from the internet and whatever, it's kind of like a database, but it's a little bit more semantic than that. And then we'll have an inference engine. 
And like this inference engine will be what people inter interface with. You ask it a question, an inference engine will, will like have all these if-then statements that the, that the subject matter experts programmed into it. And if it needs information, it'll just go to the knowledge base and it'll just work, it'll be great. And then that failed, <laughs> uh, that failed uh, miserably. We've seen a little bit of, a, of an emergence of that, like kind of coming back a little bit, but leveraging uh, more buzzwords that I won't use. So, <laughs> um, and then we kind of had two back-to-back uh, -back AI winters. So it was, uh, you know, there was this huge surge, like everyone's like, yeah, AI is gonna be great. And then there, were, there was an AI winter, and then there was the invention of backpropagation, which is this idea um, uh, in hindsight, it's actually very, very simple, but back at, the, uh, at this point in time, it wasn't that obvious that like, well, maybe we can have all these layers and it'll go through the layers, but while it's going through in this direction, it'll talk back to the prior layers and maybe give it feedback, like feedback loops, essentially. Um, and it, it's actually like mathematically not complicated at all. It's like calculus, right? Um, but at the time, you know, uh, in 86, this was, this was like kind of what, what allowed us to even start thinking that neural networks would be somewhat usable, although at the time they weren't that usable, right, because of these other reasons. Um. that are like heavily paralyzable into like a discrete card in like a computer or in a console game or something like that. And, uh, and what pushed that was like Pong, right? And like, like video games that people would play on the consumer side. Uh, I think in the 90s, like every year was roughly um, like north of $10 billion of money being poured into this. So it was a pretty big industry. Uh, I think in like, when I looked it up, like in 2011 dollars, it was like 30 billion dollars in 1998 or something like that. So it was a pretty big industry, and it's much bigger now. Last year it was 96 billion dollars, but I don't think that's in 2011 dollars. Um, and then you kind of in 1996, you had uh, single instruction, multiple data instruction sets come to x86 computers. So like they had been in computers for like ever, right? But they were like in mainframes and things like that. Like in 96 is when you actually saw those instructions come to like I think it was the Pentium 3 was the first one that had. It. So it's actually on, I think Pentium 3, was this a slot processors? Like, holy cow, those things were crazy. Uh, um, anyway, so, so you have these single instruction multiple data instructions, which, which pretty much says like, all right, I'm gonna say do one thing, but you can kind of do it on multiple sets of data at the same time. Again, this similar concept to GPUs, right? Like all of these pipelines, you know, they have hundreds or thousands of them now, but you know, th that's kind of the, the invention of that in the 96. Um, or at least coming to desktops being more accessible. And then in the 2000s, you had a lot of stuff happening, right? You had uh, general purpose GPUs. So people using these GPUs for mo more general purpose things. And the reason why they were able to do that was both uh, innovations with kind of like abstracting the interfaces using things like NVIDIA CUDA or whatever, although well, that came after general purpose. But really it was like the cost just came down because people like video games, right? So people like video games, you buy GPUs, Econo you know, how economies work means GPUs are now cheaper and they're innovating on GPUs so you can get them and you know, rinse, uh, you know, repeat. And you had kind of uh, two things going on as well, you know, Moore's Law and Crider's Law, everybody knows Moore's Law, right? Like, uh, transistors double every 18 months, 18 to 24 months. Uh, Crider's Law is pretty much the same thing except it's for data density, right? So it's just saying like, this is how fast we think things are gonna, um, how, how fast we think the density is gonna increase in, in storage media. And that, that both of those have, have felt pretty true, and there's a lot of conversation of those are going to break. You know, like, um, can you do like 3D? Can you use graphene nanotubes? And you know, whatever. Uh, you know, at the the size that we're talking about now, like uh, in the nanometers and stuff, like you can't even like it's too small for like the wavelength of light. So like you can't even like there was some thought that you would use light to do it, but like you literally can't. Except like they found some hacks to go around it. You know, whatever. But there's some potential that it'll keep going, there's some potential that it'll drop off, you know. I don't, I don't really know. Um, and then you, you've also got kind of uh, ASICs and FPGA, so fling point, uh, 
data arrays and applications, which are just like pieces of hardware, right? Especially specific, right? So like very specialized and FPGAs. Um, I know a, a lot less about that I know about ASICs, but um, from what I understand, they're a little bit more programmable, but they're a beast to actually like program and like deal with. So if anybody in here knows the, the program in FPGA, like come talk to me because I would love to buy one and work on a project with an FPGA instead of doing an ASIC something. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of why we're at we're the point we are now. It's like compute has kind of increased enough and math has increased enough and data is easy enough to obtain that you know now we have all the building blocks to actually execute on the math and at the same time you know these algorithms are getting more and more fine-tuned because they're actually useful now so the perform you know the performance is getting lower um, higher and higher you know it's more performant um, so you need less compute but at the same time you're getting more compute um, just because of innovation so this is this is basically like a, a Venn diagram of you know what some people would call data science, right? And data science is is like the science of looking at uh, large sets of information and trying to to gather um, uh, to 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 make inferences about it, to maybe um, uh, project about what the future, you know, do some predictive analytics or um, mechanistic uh, work. I'll talk about this in a slide. Um, but you kind of have these hacking skills, math and statistic knowledge, and, and substances. Uh, experience, and then you have kind of these over overlaps, right? So hacking skills, think of hacking skills as like ghetto software engineering, right? It's like, in their mind, what hacking skills are is that like you can get something done with a programming language, not necessarily like you're gonna break into a computer. So, uh, so, so, you know, between like being kind of a really bad software engineer and having knowing about math and statistics, like you could do machine learning, right? Um, if you know about math and stats and you have some experience like in the area that you're trying to apply this, you know, you could do some traditional research. Um, and then like at the apex of all of them, you have data science. And then over here, you've got this like danger zone where it's like, you know, you might be able to cobble something together and you have some experience there, but like you don't fully understand what the math says um, or, or what the math means. And so because this talk uh, isn't meant for people with like math PhDs or heavy statistics background, I like to say welcome to the danger zone uh, because we're only going to be talking about things kind of in that area, the intersection of experience and being able to put something together in the program language. Uh, so I'm going to briefly talk about some techniques and I'm going to see if I can pull up some notes here real quick. Um, what is that? Oh, that's what I wanted. Nice. <laughs> see, now I can see my notes. You're in for it now. All right. It did come to the, to the windows. All right, so let's talk about, uh, quickly about some techniques. So I'm going to kick it off with a quote from a, from a great book, How to Measure Anything. So the fact is that we often have more data than we think. We need less data than we think. And getting more data through observation is simpler than we think. So I thought that was, that was kind of interesting um, because, I don't know, I guess maybe back in the day I thought that like in order to do anything interesting with, with data you needed like mounts and mounts of like you needed, if you didn't have 10 petabytes like go away, right? And I don't think that's really necessary in, in today's era. Um, I don't think it was necessary back then either. I was just too naive to understand that. <laughs> um, so I'll briefly talk about a couple of techniques and, and this is, these are the, the kind of the six fundamental questions of data science, right? And I'm going to cheat a little bit by reading off my slides to make sure I don't say something wrong because when they get in the middle here, uh, I end up switching them up very frequently. So um, descriptive is, is, is very obvious, right? It, you're describing the data. So you have this, this pile of data and you're just, you're just telling people what it is. So like, you know, this is census data, and, you know. Um, and then, just scroll down. Um, and then you kind of have exploratory questions, right? So you're um, trying to find a relationship in the data, right? Like these two things seem like they may be related. These two columns or, you know, these two different sets of, of uh, you know, these different tables might be related. You know, maybe there's some key where I can link them together or whatever. Like finding those linkages would be kind of exploratory questions that you could ask your data. Then inferential would be like, <clears throat> I have this set of data Let's go back to census data, right? Um, I have this set of data, but I want to know about everything, but I don't have data about everything. So I'm going to use what I have to like extrapolate or infer about everything, given what I have, right? Um, you can have 
addictive, which uh, this, this is kind of the point right here where I, I think that, um, I think it's reasonable to expect, you know, some companies to be at that are looking at data, you know, maybe um, inferential, predictive, not really in the causal or mechanistic, because that, that, that's a, a little bit ridiculous. But predictive is like, okay, so what's gonna happen next? So that would be like, given the history of the stock market, what will happen next in the stock market? Given what I about these, you know, different stock tickers, right? What, what is gonna happen with this one? I think that this one in one month will be here. That is, that would be a prediction, right? Um, and you're gonna build on that with this causal and mechanistic questions that you would ask your data. Um, and so causal is a, is a tight relationship. So, um, so it would be, uh, so it'd be like if, if I change this one, this number of bytes transferred, then I believe that this field should also change because you know one is was influenced by the other, right? That's kind of ca a causal relationship, um, and that's kind of uh, I guess you you like a like a lighter term for what mechanistic relationships would be, which is a lot more specific. So you say, I increment this one by five, and that one increments by seven. Like, literally, you know exactly what's gonna happen, and that's, that's so far outside of the realm of what we can currently do that I don't think it's realistic to, um, I have a hard time even really talking about how that would work because it's, it's so perfect, right? It's so like, you know exactly everything about this data that it's such a closed system that why are you asking questions about it? If you're at this point, you pretty much know everything about it, right? Um, which would be really impressive to get to, but. Um, and I had a bunch of other techniques on here that I ripped off because I didn't want to talk about it for like a day. But um, if you're interested, this, this talk right here, besides Vancouver 2015, Alex Loeffler, if you're interested in these techniques, he worked for a telecom and he talked about implementing a lot of different um, techniques. Not, I guess I shouldn't say these techniques because the techniques that I ripped off of this slide that you should just know what they are, right? Um, uh, but anyways, like doing different types of like uh, uh, linear, linear um, logistic regressions or principal component analysis as different machine learning techniques, you know, whatever. He talks about a lot of those can, in an applied infosec um, uh, context, which is it's really awesome. I, I probably watched this talk like three times. I love it. Uh, it's great. He, he talks about even how to operationalize some of these things. So this idea of like challenger champion. So you might have multiple algorithms or multiple, you know, questions that are constantly being asked to your data. And how do you, how do you not like, how do you experiment and use new, ask new questions without like the risk of like just completely breaking your system, right? So like um, kind of breaking up the statistically distributing, um, maybe the champion would get 80% of the time, you know, you would ask the, cha the champion question and a small percentage of the time you would ask the challenger que question. And if the challenger seems like it's like, has a, um, a higher rate of being true, then you, you increase the percentage and it eventually becomes the champion. And um, so, but, but knowing what questions to ask is really hard, right? Like, so going back to these six questions, like, I don't know, it's, it's really difficult to, like, you think you know what you wanna ask, right? Like, I think I know what I wanna ask my data, but like, it just seems to not answer the right way. Um, and again, the internet helped me out here and See, now it's in this presenter mode. I gotta do all of this funkiness. Right, let's just do this. What? I don't know how to computer today, guys, sorry. See that? No, you can't see anything. Oh. Sorry. Oh man, now everything's broken. Oh, because the, the, it's not on the right input. Um, is he gonna pick me up? There we go. This is really killing my transition. Da -da.
Hello, uh, just after semi-skimmed milk. Your search for semi-skimmed milk returned zero results. We don't sell milk. Your search for milk returned 52,256 results. Your top hit, milk of magnesia. No. Milk floats of yesteryear. No. This milk team family No, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for, you know, normal milk. Couldn't find what you were looking for. That's what I'm saying. I couldn't find it, so I'm asking you if you could... Advance, sir. All right. Let's do this. <laughs> Kiwa, no. Go. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Milk, please narrow your search by using one of the following filters.
to, to be less sensitive to, um, to uh, outliers than like ordinary least squares and things like that. But um, the point is that, you know, you can gather statistical information. It's, it's very helpful. There are some good techniques to, uh, um, to gather that at high scale. My wife was just telling me about something called blue Gatorade right now. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> um, uh, you, can, you can kind of gather this information at a huge scale, and it'll, it'll, it'll help you to answer those easy questions, those initial questions that you kind of need to get familiar, get acquainted with your data. But you're not going to go really that far. And just to just put the nail in this coffin, uh, there was this great project. Um, I hope this, this GIF, not GIF, this GIF works. Because um, it's, it's just hilarious. So um, in this next slide, Every, you, you'll see at the right, there's, there's all of these, um, all of the statistical summary information is roughly the same, but you can see based off of that, it's not, they're not the same. So you can see here's the mean, median, standard deviation, correlation, things like that. Like literally they put a dinosaur in here and it's all the same. Like there are ways where your data could be, you know, these are, these are nowhere near each other. And even the transitions are, um, uh, aligned with kind of this. So, so it's great for those introductory, those initial questions, but you're not going to answer everything with them. And so, so kind of what do you do next, right? So next is a bunch of buzzwords, right? Next is machine learning. Next is, you know, cognitive uh, neural networks and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So, but, and with that, there's, there's two categories, right? There's supervised and unsupervised. And people talk about this crap all the time. They say clustering and categorization, whatever. And it's like, I used to have a slide with a bunch of words on it. I'm like, Please give me a picture. So, you know, this place gave me a picture and it looks great. So, essentially, the core difference between the two. Unsupervised, you don't need as structured of data, and it's just gonna group, right? It's gonna say, it's gonna do feature extraction. It's gonna say, here are some interesting attributes of this data. It's gonna extract that first. And then it's gonna group them and say, like, based on my features that I extracted, these things are similar because I'm a computer, just trust me. And that's, that's a big key part of this, is, is there's a lot of like, I'm a computer, just trust me, i.e. it's non-deterministic. You can't go back and say, dude, you just totally messed up. Why did you make the decision? It's like, I don't know, man, I'm moving on, right? It's, it's moving forward, right? You, it's a non, these, are, these unsupervised machine learning algorithms are non-deterministic. You can't go back and ask them. So a lot of people have been going to these kind of supervised machine learning algorithms. So, so this, is a, this is a classification problem. So here, I'm just gonna cluster, I'm just making a group. I don't know what the group means. That's up to the humans, right? You figure out what the heck that group means. But with supervised, you're actually saying like, no, 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 this is bad, or this is good. Like you're classifying it as good, or you're classifying it as bad, right? And you can kind of see that in, in this, you also have a lot of unknowns. It's like unable to classify, like just throw up its hand, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and like I said, with unsupervised machine learning, you can do that on kind of more abstract on structured data. With supervised, you need, um, which is kind of where, where most things are happening right now is, is with supervised, you need labeled data. It needs to be identified to, to do the training, to establish the model to use in the field, right? To use day to day, right? This is, let's just pick on a vendor real quick, like a Silence or something. They train it with labeled data in their labs, put together a model, shove that model out to wherever it runs, and you know it gets it gets it, it does the classification with the model, but in order to go back, like they had to know what features to extract, right? Like what is bad? You know, is is number of bytes bad? Like I don't know if you talk to some people, like yes, there's like a high correlation between like like if I'll, if it's a large file, it's probably not bad, right? There's some it's like 86% of files over like 10 megs. I'm making most of this up, but there's generally there is a statistic that says big files are probably good, right? And that's part of what goes into these classification algorithms, right? So you give it structured data, uh, and you give it labeled information and train it. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, because I don't want to belabor the point. And this is, this, is, this is great because like, I keep not knowing what my next slide is, so let me do that again. I hope I don't break everything. There's no more, there's no more videos, I'm sorry, so <laughs> I can do that. Um, so it's exciting, but it's also extremely immature. So there's a lot of problems with some, how this stuff works and, uh, you know, it's funny, I'm, on, I'm in this like data science Slack channel. Um, I think it's literally like data science.slack or something like that. 
Uh, it's run by a really cool guy, Alex Pinto, uh, who has his company, does a lot of really good machine learning stuff. If you ever heard of the MLSEC, Machine Learning Security Project, he's the guy who runs that. Um, anyways, we were talking on there about like, somebody saw a paper or a webcast about Silence, and I don't mean to keep picking on them, it's just something that I hear more people complain about. <laughs> and they were talking about how do they adjust for false positives that get identified, right? And they're like, well, they do like centroid adjustments and things like that. Like they just kind of like make, made up some terms. They're like, we just adjust the center point of this geometric feature of this cluster to, you know, to not be, make false positives anymore. And I think a lot, a lot of the infosec, the machine learning infosec community just kind of laughed at that. It's like, what does that even mean? I think you just made that up. Um, so it's exciting, but it's immature, and I'm gonna like, kind of illustrate how immature it is with uh, machine learning with computer vision, um, but this, this extrapolates generally to like, machine learning on a lot of different things. So, um, so that is a Husky, uh, and there was a machine learning algorithm, um, a CNN, that identified that this is a wolf. Now this is gonna get real interactive here for a second. Why do you think that it classified this as a wolf? Because it looks like a wolf, who said that? Okay, it looks like a wolf. Maybe? Anyone agree with that? Probably because it looks like a wolf? Yeah. Okay, facial features, maybe? Okay. Looks pretty similar. I, I think it looks like a wolf. I have a neighbor that has a dog like that. It's part wolf, so like, whatever. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is a wolf, and I'm wrong in calling it a husky. I don't know. Anyone have any other ideas why it would be classified as a wolf? It's in the woods. That's a great one. Same thing, all right. So that's, that's almost spot on, right? So why is it classifying this as a wolf? Because there's snow. <laughs> Literally, it's the, the, everything that's not blocked off, that's, why, that's the explanation from this machine learning algorithm of why that's a wolf. It's because there's snow on the ground. Like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> that's ridiculous. I mean, I, it looks like a wolf to me. I would call it that, but you know, machine learning is very immature. Like, this kind of stuff happens all the time. And, and like I said, with unsupervised machine learning algorithms, you can't go back and ask why a lot of the times. You, this is kind of like, you're, you have to prep it from the beginning to be able to do a lot of these expl ex explanatory, um, like give you answers as to why it did what it did. And even then it's mm, a little bit rough. Um, I wonder what my next slide is. This is a great guessing game. Uh, I'm gonna do this. Uh, so here's another one that actually was a great blog that just came out I don't know, a couple of days ago or something like that. This was an example of like the limitations of deep learning. And, and deep learning just means like machine learning to layered on machine learning, layered on machine learning. It's deep. Um, so that's a boy holding uh, what I guess is a baseball bat. Um, so, okay. Uh, that's obviously inaccurate. Um, but there, there's a lot of other ones that really like blew my mind whenever I started looking into this. So like, I even had a hard time with this, so it's kind of understandable that computers would too, but like, is that a chihuahua or a muffin? <laughs> Can any of you guys, I mean, that one's definitely a chihuahua. Like, this one, I'm not really sure. Um, so a chihuahua or a muffin. Uh, how about a labradoodle or fried chicken? Um, <laughs> looks pretty similar to me. I could understand why, you know, machine learning might think, you know, computer vision algorithms might think that they're the same thing. How about a sheepdog or mop? I mean, wow, actually, like, I had to look pretty closely at this one to figure out that it wasn't a dog, right? So you can kind of understand, but at the same time, if you're just gonna blindly trust the decision that a computer machine learning algorithm made, like, it's gonna call all of this one or another, or it's gonna be mixed, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of trust. And at the same time, as just being inaccurate when faced with challenging information, what happens if there's a bad guy actually trying to manipulate this adversarial machine learning, right? So that's a panda. This machine learning algorithm, computer vision algorithm, said yes, that's a panda. And then it kind of you know, took aspects from a gibbon, and, 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 and this is the, kind of what they call the, the gibbon class gradient. Um, and they layered it on top of this panda image, and now they got this, um, this to be categorized as a gibbon now. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's still a panda. Um, I can't even really see this layered on there, but if you look really close, it's a little bit discolored, maybe, but like to think that that is that is a given, but by layering this is is, is kind of uh, a little bit rough. And the way that they do this is is essentially like understanding um, what weights in the machine learning algorithm, especially with a neural net and things like that, where there's lots of layers. Um, uh, you kind of uh, accentuate 
the characteristics that say this is a given, right? And you just kind of like force it down that path, and then you like um, you um, you deprioritize the attributes of the picture that it would um, use to characterize it as a panda, and now it's a given, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm gonna move on to data sources, and then the toll, and I'm out here. So first of all, with data sources, I'm gonna ask a couple questions. So uh, a lot of blue teamers in the room, you'll probably know this better than uh, anybody else, but you know, anybody's uh, welcome to answer. So with given um, InfoSec data, how, how much data do you guys have? Do you, how many people, raise your hand if you have greater than 100 gigs? Personally? Uh, at, at, at a company, right? Or, or if you have, personally too, I mean if you do InfoSec for yourself. So greater than 100 gigs. I hope I see pretty much everybody raise their hand, because uh, if you have less than 100 gigs, like, um, okay. Uh, so how about a terabyte, greater than a terabyte? All right, greater than like 10 terabytes? Greater than 100 terabytes? Greater than a petabyte? Okay, two. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, me too, right? Uh, so that was fun. You know, we had one and a half petabytes is roughly the system that I put together to do to do my stuff on. Um, but it's but it's kind of interesting. Like with all this data comes a lot of problems, right? Um, so there's this problem of like garbage in, garbage out, which like is so foundational, but it's still a problem everywhere I go, right? Like if you feed in garbage data, you're gonna get out garbage. Data, right? like it's not like they, we don't have these magic machines yet that just like do everything for you. You need to be a little bit prescriptive and you know normalize the information and clean it and you know remove fields, maybe add fields, do enrichments, you know, add context, you know, whatever. You need you need to clean your data instead of just shoving it into something and be like, oh, I hope it works right now. That garbage in coming out is something like beneficial would be like if we actually had usable unsupervised machine learning algorithms, which we don't. And so Specifically, the kind of data that I'm talking about would be, you know, network forensics information. So I talked about Bro, Yaf, NetFlow, you know, Bro like the con log essentially, like the, the network summarization information. Um, network IDS, uh, kind of a little bit more detailed. Maybe also like DPI style information. So like all of the other Bro logs, all of the Circada and Snort, you know, particle analyzers that they have, the alerts that come out of these network IDS systems. Uh, NetFlow is actually there twice because it's so important that I forgot to remove it. Um, <clears throat> operating system logs, right? You always want to have your OS logs, uh, syslog, uh, which could be you know operating system logs, you know output from scripts that you run, cron jobs, you know specific programs that wouldn't be like kernel based or whatever. Endpoint agents, you know EDR, AV, OS again because again OS is obviously really important, just like NetFlow because I. I'm bad at slides. Uh, authentication and authorization logs, right? So like your LDAP service, Kerberos, things like that. And then application logs, which is kind of like back to syslog. That is just a picture, because I feel like, I feel like if you don't have pictures, your slides are really boring. So I added this picture, it's like how Bro works a little bit. From like, I don't know, there's no, it's like from 2000, oh, 2004. Yeah, so it's super ancient. Um, so I'm gonna talk about one analysis tool. Whenever I gave this, I gave a similar talk before, I talked about a couple. Um, you know, there are, there are competitors to this, like Apache Spot is an incubating project from Cloudera, does similar things, but more uh, in the non-deterministic side, more, a little bit more advanced without the foundation. Um, the project I have is a little bit more foundation and a platform to do your machine learning on, instead of like here are like the, the algorithms to use. And then there's another one called Rita, if you guys know like John Strand, and Black Hills InfoSec, Offensive Countermeasures, Paul Lassadorian. Um, they, have, they have a tool too, which is, which is pretty interesting, I've been playing a lot with recently. So, <clears throat> So, and actually, you trying to use this information, uh, there's this great from the, uh, quote from this book, Data Driven Security, that says, if the environment is too complex and feedback is delayed or ambiguous, algorithms will generally and relatively consistently outperform human judgment. Um, and I feel like that rings true for me as like a, like a more hardcore blue team guy. Um, I would be like, like right on the edge of blue and purple, right? I don't really like to do much more than a vulnerability assessment, although I've done a couple pen tests. Um, <clears throat> I, I feel like that rings true. Like if I ask a question and then I have to walk away for three hours before I get the answer and then come back, if I can't like interact 
quickly with my information or in a way that's intuitive. You know, I might forget some of the context as to why I asked the question. If you have to work on like a forensics investigation over like six months, like it's gonna be a lot more confusing than if you bust it out in an afternoon, right? And so I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about this project called Apache Metron and just to lay the foundation, I'm gonna bust through this real quick. But you have to understand Hadoop. Is anybody here familiar with Hadoop? Um, Yarn, HDFS, I see a couple of like, eh, I'm not gonna raise my hand, but I kinda know something, heard of it at least. Um, so it came out of Google. It's a, it's a highly distributed system, so it has, you know, you could run it on hundreds, thousands of, of systems, it distributes very well. Um, and it addresses the three Vs of data, you have uh, volume, velocity, and variety. Although people like, you know, whenever you have like the three Vs of data, then you have like, you stick your marketing team after it and you're like, oh, we can't just have three Vs. We're gonna add a fourth V because like we're better than everyone else at big data. So like now there's like all of these Vs that are just like absolutely ridiculous. I actually found an article that was like the 10 Vs of data. I was like, this is, this is getting crazy. This is, this is absolutely getting crazy. Um, but there, uh, I can see there's some validity to it, but it's totally marketing. Um, and th this ecosystem has changed a lot. So if you looked at it back in 2006, it'd be like two things, right? Like you have MapReduce and you have HDFS, which is the file system, distributed file storage and retrieval uh, computation. And like as years gone on, it's kind of taken this microservices approach where like we want to do more with it uh, and we want to add things to it. So it's like, we'll call this the Hadoop ecosystem now. And like there's really just like a million components. Like, um, and when I say a million components, I mean like a million components. Like, this is a list of all of the big data landscape in 2016. This is, this is absolutely ridiculous. Like, I, <laughs> I can't even wrap my head around like half of those. So um, it's really like this big, broad area. There's lots of different tools, but it's kind of, um, the idea is like everything does its, its one thing really, really well. Like there's this one thing just for configuration management called Zookeeper. Like it literally puts a config file in a place where you can query it and get the current config in a really fast and reliable way. So like it allows you to do, um, in like a distributed computing environment, um, you, can, you can kind of, uh, you don't have to, it, it keeps you from having to restart your services. Like getting a config, pulling into memory, just keeping it there until you restart. Like having a really solid config management, like really fast product, you can just query it every time you need the config. So when you make a change, like the change is instant. There's no restarts, there's no rebooting, rolling crap, offerings, you know, none of that stuff has to be done. Uh, with this ecosystem, which is really nice, but also makes it really complicated, as this shows. And also, a lot of this stuff is open source, and so I found this awesome tweet uh, that says, the best software is just buggy enough to generate just enough support revenue to fund long-term development. This is pretty much the state of like the Hadoop ecosystem, right? So like, it's not, there's not a super high emphasis on QA, right? Like, uh, it's good, it's not gonna be perfect, um, they put a lot of focus on the really important things, like not losing information, you know, uh, having robust, highly available. Uh, but like, yeah, if you ask this, uh, you know, if you, if you like um, have this complicated logic in their domain specific language, like you may hit a bug because, you know, it wasn't expecting null at this one point and it's just gonna, you know, exit instead of giving you like some sort of error message saying like this was a problem uh, or like properly like handling that exception. So Metron, this is the logo. Uh, I'm gonna speed things up a little bit, but there's essentially two architectures for handling uh, big data technologies, ingesting information, asking questions to it. First is Lambda, so you can ignore all of these, like Kafka, Storm, Hadoop, whatever, and just think of it like information comes in and then it gets split up into two streams. One is for, um, you know, Storm is a little bit more uh, streaming based and, and um, Hadoop is more bat batch based. And they really mean to say like MapReduce. Um, and then it, then it stores it into this, this database and queries for applications go against two different databases. Now if you want to do the same thing in both sides, you have to do it in the storm way and in, in the Hadoop way. So it's like now I have to know how to do it two different ways. I can't just like copy and paste the code. I have to know the nuances of the product. So there's this newer like Kappa which tries to unify it and it's really just stream processing. They got rid of batch. And they just said, well, like, if you need to do batch, we'll treat, it, we'll treat it like a really fast, really big stream. Like, we'll just, like, back up time and handle this giant batch as a giant stream. Um, and that allows you to write it once and handle everything that same way. So if I want to reprocess something, like, I just figured out how to do something in streaming, it works. If I want to reprocess the last, all of my data, you know, two years, 
it's just gonna essentially rewind time and run all of that through that, that same streaming process again. So this, this is really nice because you also have unified databases so the applications only have to query the one place that's stored instead of having separate tables or databases or whatever. So I talked about a lot of that. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to deploy it. You know, Docker and Vagrant and AWS. And I think it works on Azure too. HD Insight is actually Hortonworks backed, which is one of the teams that, that deals with this project. Um, so like, I'm pretty sure it would work. Uh, and you can run it on bare metal, you know, uh, at, the prior, at the company that I was at. I still do some part-time work there. Um, it was like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in servers. Um, a couple petabyte of storage, and um, I was able to install it on that pretty pretty seamlessly and handle. That's a, that's a small small scale for this. You know, some of the biggest customers are like Hadoop ecosystem, or like Yahoo, and they've got like thousands of systems, right? They have. I think I, I watched a talk where they went from like ten to hundred petabytes, uh, and it was like years and years and years ago. I'm like, man, I'm lucky I can get two petabytes. <laughs> um, it's got a lot of components. Since you guys weren't like super familiar with Hadoop, I'm not gonna beat you over the head with this. Um, it's got some personas, so the, the, the idea of this is that you might have like a SOC analyst, which would be like your first tier, they can kind of go in and, and dig around and find some things and then escalate it up to an investigator, either a SOC investigator or a forensics investigator. Um, and then they can do like the more detailed um, digging and you know, have some different permissions and you know, restricted fields and there's some plans to use like a Cumulo so you can do um, column level, row level or field level access control, which is kind of nice. Then the platform engineer, which is like the guy, uh, the guy or gal who's gonna like roll it out, like actually set this up. That's a persona. A data scientist, which is really cool. They have like these, like, um, like a Jupyter new book kind of deal in Zeppelin, uh, where you just like write your code, and instead of like, not right now, but in a lot of places right now, a data scientist would like bring that code to their laptop and then like run it on their laptop, and like if they don't have enough RAM to hold all the data, like they're gonna have to do all these hacks to like retrieve it off the disk as needed and, and, and then you're pretty much swapping and it's just a big nightmare. Like this allows you to like write the code and then it distributes it so on all of your all your server, it distributes the job. So it runs the job where the data is for the job. So like if the data is on 17 servers, it breaks that task up into 17 tasks, runs it on the servers and does this, uh, it maps them out, does the job and then reduces them back to your answer. It's map reduce, right? And then sock manager, which is like, I like pictures, and you know, graphs are nice, and whatever. Um, some key features, so like, this is what it actually does, right? So it does streaming, data normalization, and cleansing. So, um, so I talked earlier about garbage in, garbage out, and this attempts to fix that problem with a bit of a scalpel approach. So it's not like, a lot of the seam vendors are like, just throw your logs at me, man, I'll handle it. Right, like I've got a million bazillion ways to parse this thing, I'll figure out what this is, I'm putting it in my, my format, it's gonna be great. Um, this is a little bit less like trying to do that and it's more like, okay, send in a type of logs, um, send as many of them as you want, like literally send a million a second, like whatever, just send a bunch of them in um, and tell me exactly how to parse them out and then uh, that'll be the first tier and then it'll, um, we'll clean it up for you, we'll, we'll make it in the Metron format or whatever, you know, if, if, there, if there was a standard format for data, and if anyone knows of a standard format for data, we'd love to implement it. Um, there's some talk about Cloudera bringing one with their open data model. If it's successful, we'd happily do it. Uh, but right now we just do like a Metron thing because it's the best we got. Um, clean it up, and so now like way later on in the process, I can make a bunch of assumptions that like these fields are gonna be there, these ones won't. Um, it does streaming enrichment, so like as the data's coming in, I can add context to it, I can be like, Oh, like I have this thread intel feed, it said his IP was bad. I'm gonna add a little uh, key value pair to the JSON and be like, you know, this thread intel feed said it was bad, like in this way, and you can add multiple of them or whatever. Uh, you can do it custom too, so like one of the things that we worked with was like IPAM information, uh, or really DDR in our case. Um, so it's like, I know that this is the subnet, it's named this, it has this description, it's used for this. Like I'm gonna put all these labels on this thing as it comes through. Because like in the future this might be helpful. And like there's some solutions that say like you should do that on the query. But it's a lot more difficult to do that on query. Like I query this information, then add the context. Like what if that subnet got repurposed, right? It's a different subnet now than it was then. And like maybe you could kind of do it if you had all of your history. It seems like a lot more complicated to me. And this is kind of their adding context to the data, which is helpful for 
query response, but it's more helpful for machine learning because you have all that context there. Like you don't have to add context if you're trying to do any machine learning. Which it has this modeling as a service thing, which is like, give us an API to your program, which interfaces with the model that you want, and we'll make it work in this environment. It stores PCAP, which is really cool. Um, like people pay a lot of money for PCAP storage and retrieval, and this does that. And uh, this fed Intel stuff. That's what it looks like. That's pretty. Uh, that's how it goes left to right, usually. Um, and it goes through these tiers, right? I kind of just explained them, though. Um, these are some examples. Palo Alto, supported. Uh, ASA, Bro, Lanco, ICE, whatever. There's more than this now. There's also like a simple way to just do a grok pattern and you know, bust it out real quick. It has a bunch of notable improvements. This slide is like really hard to read. Uh, it got faster recently. It's got some UIs, it has a REST API. So everything is via the REST API. Like they built a REST API, then they built all the UIs on top of it. So if you can do it in the command line, you can do it there. It's got a demo, Docker demo environment. Stellar functions allows you to do like live streaming manipulation in a way that's configurable without having to do restarts. So you can do whatever you want there. Um, things are coming soon. I'll do a quick demo. Anyone have any questions while I set up the demo? Because it might take like 30 seconds to do. Um, you, you, you changed things. Is this the HDMI adapter? So I'm just going to cross my fingers. How many adapters can we have in a row? It should work. It should work. That's true. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this real quick. Yeah. Yeah, like enough. Oh no, I'm plugged into this, which is VGA. Okay. Alright, well maybe the demo won't work, so um, I'm gonna give this a few more seconds. And then just say if you want a demo, I will give you one. <laughs> There's also a YouTube channel. I'm gonna I'm gonna I have. Oh, I just have a bunch of links. If you guys want links, let me know. I made an InfoSec starter kit and like a situational little awareness pack, which are like a bunch of RSS feeds and podcasts that I like. They're on my GitHub. Uh, I don't even know why I'm mentioning that. I just have it in here. Uh, oh, what I did make for this was like, if you're really interested in this stuff and you're like, man, you, you glossed over it at a super high level, I would say like go to my GitHub page and I have a doc just for this, just a big readme. And it's like, if, you, if you're familiar with like awesome lists, it's just like a huge pages and pages of information. Uh, well, I did that like for this. So there's like a list of podcasts, a little list of training events, conferences that you can go to, like books you could read, white papers to look at, you know, whatever. If you just wanna, like, they're all categorized up so you could just like, I only listen to podcasts. Like go there and there's like five options and things like that. Um, Maybe. I was just gonna show the UI anyways. I mean, UIs are UIs, right? Uh, it looks like the UI to me at least. I've been searching for a long time. I'm pretty much at time anyways. I don't wanna bore you guys. What's up? I was gonna ask you a question. Can you tell us a little bit about your company? CISO? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not CISO, it's CISO. That's the first thing to understand. It's S-E-I-S-O. People call it CISO, it's CISO. Um, I do InfoSec Consulting. So uh, we, we uh, it's myself and two other guys right now. We, um, two of them have been CISOs before. I don't know why I'm paired up with them, but I am. I just do technology things, so I'm the CTO. I, I like anytime there's like a, like if you need like security engineering help or security architecture help or something like that, I go in and help you. I do a lot of security orchestration and automation. Um, I do like Metron things, seems. I like network IDSs and crypto is fun, uh, stuff like that. I'm not a developer though. I do some static code analysis, what's up? Where do you, where do you source your uh, test data that you use for the development? Where do I source my test data yeah, for? I mean, do you get it from clients? Do you get it from, where, where's all your tests? I data? have this awesome arrangement right now where I'm a part-time uh, part employee of Carnegie Mellon University, so I just abuse the hell out of that. Like. They're like, here's 85 terabytes a day of data to play with, and we're gonna pay you to play with it, and 
Like, so I do that. <laughs> I, I have never used, um, I've never even asked for, I don't even want, I don't even want customer data. I will set it up for you and your environment. I don't want that crap. That's a liability. Uh, what's up? From, from uh, your affiliation with Carnegie, have you ever found any data from Ren Isaac useful? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> um, not really. No. Okay. No. No. I mean, really, really small areas where like there's a, a prevalent fish or a really good fish that comes out. Like that's been helpful. Um, but like their automated feeds, like there was a period a couple months ago where like their thread intel feed just like broke for a couple months and like no one even noticed because whatever. Uh, I'm not ragging on them. They're, they they have a great mission and. Um, they try, it's just, you know, I don't know, if you're in Renisac, like, you go on the IRC channels, like, these dudes are, like, they're just talking about, like, random stuff. Like, you're not talking about InfoSec right now. Like, I don't want to talk about your dog, and I don't want to, I want to talk about InfoSec stuff. If that's not why we're here, then I'm not going to be here. So, I stopped. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Nice. whoa. Give these guys a hand. Yeah. All right, so, um, I'm going to my fingers and hope this Vega for Zoom works. Yep, I have eight gigs of RAM, so it's not gonna swamp like crazy. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So there's really only like two interfaces. One's like a management interface, and one's an analyst interface. The analyst interface is literally a pull request right now, so it's not merged into master. It's not in a release. It, you know, there's gonna be a lot of iteration on iteration on it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's a little like asterisk. But like, it's not fully featured right now. Um, but it literally was only like maybe a few weeks of work. Um, and one of the things that I like about the Metron team is that they do things right the first time and then they can really build on it. So like, new features take a little bit longer to come out. But when they come out, like, you can just assume that they're working. Like, obviously we test them and QA them and, you know, unit tests and integration tests and all that fun stuff. Um, Uh huh. So I'm running this, you know, Metron cluster in a single VM. Uh, you know, this is what the data looks like. So like this is one set of data is a DNS log, you know, from Bro. Here's an HTTP log from Bro. It's just a big JSON blob, right? Like so. Um, and what I did here was I was kind of consuming it from the first tier. There's a second tier, um, which is enrichment. So it goes through three layers. I didn't want to bore you guys with like the architecture details unless you're interested, but there's three tiers. Like it comes in, it gets normalized, then it gets sent to an enrichment tier that does like custom enrichments, you know, stellar transformations, you ask questions to it, does thread and tell, then it gets indexed. And the indexing tier is super modular, so you just like, where do you want to index it? And it shoves it there. Mostly it's like Elasticsearch, Solar, HDFS. Um, so you can kind of like look at this stuff. It's, it's not that interesting. Um, but here's what it looks like when it's, um, uh, when after it's enriched, so you can just tell like the point is that it's bigger, right? It just like had things added to it, um, so whatever's that worth? That's worth. Um, I'm super lazy, so I'm just gonna you know, copy and paste these things. So here's the Metron UI. Um, I don't remember what the password is, so I use this little handy dandy thingy there. Uh, it's like user password. This is the people. So um, so these are just like the parsers, right? So like it can parse YAF, Bro, ASA, whatever. Uh, and you can edit it and say like, all right, you know, this parser type, let's look at the schema, you know, it has three enrichments, two thread intel feeds, no transformations going on. I click this little button here, you can see like, here's a sample log of what we're kind of expecting as a bro log. Here are the different fields and you can say like, in this field, it's going to do a geo enrichment and it's going to do a thread intel enrichment to see if this is a malicious IP. Like you could just kind of like add or remove from that uh, using this console. Um, you know, you can add fields, you can, you know, adjust what the timestamp is, you know, if you want to do a transformation on it, there's only a small amount. You can do, like, uh, bloom filters and hyperlog log um, evaluations. You can check the entropy of the string. Um, there's a bunch of new ones, like, ready to be merged right now. It's like, um, you know, check if it's encoded. If it's encoded, you know, using Base64, then decode it. Then do, like, some evaluation on it. Um, it also keeps the provenance, so like there's this a ridge, um, I forget what it's called, a ridge something field, it's not in here. Oh, original string, uh, where like you always know what you started with. 
So like, if your if your enrichments go haywire, like you can always go back to what you started with. Five minutes. Yep. Um, I'm like pretty much done. Um, and then you can do like basic, you know, very basic settings. This just this is is pretty new. Um, but the point is that now, if you wanted to make a new one, uh, you know, there's if you wanted to make a new um, enrichment and, and normalize it, you can kind of put it in here. And there's uh, a method to like look at the JSON, right? Look, so here's your config. Here's like the JSON when it's broken out. Like your indexing configuration. So you can see that this is indexing to Solar, Elasticsearch, and HDFS. You know, it has some like risk level rules so for threat triage, like whatever. If it's not in this subnet, then the score is 10. And you can do like, you know, max aggregations and things like that. So like, pick the highest number of all the questions that we've asked. If it's 100, then make it alertable and our software will look at it. Um, there's also, um, you can kind of like put in, I forget where it is, but you can put in like a string and say like, and here's a crop pattern, crop pattern, and it'll tell you everything that it would do if it were to process that one, and you can be like, oh, that's what I expected, or like, no, that's broken, and you fix it before like you push it into production. And then, oops. Uh, and then there's this, this other UI, which is on the same port, so I have to stop one and do the other, because I'm too lazy to do dash dash port. Uh, it's still starting up. This is the analytics, so this is like the thing that's still in a pull request form, and it's pretty much some basic like table filtering and um, things like that, but there are some goals to make it very Kibana-like, um, but focused on the data set that we have. So if you're familiar with Kibana, um, in fact, there is Kibana too, so I could just do like node one 5,000, and like you can log into Kibana, and you know, th this is there as well. Um, I don't know. So yeah, they have like little graphs, and you know, you know what Kibana looks like. This is Kibana, right? Um, basic aggregations. This is a map if it ever loads. Um, yeah, whatever. And this is the new UI, so you can kind of do like searches, you can save searches. It's it's pretty rudimentary right now. So like I'm gonna search for everything that's snort, and you know, I wanna add, you know, refresh rates, um, I can dismiss things, I can, uh, this is still in a pull request, so I haven't looked at it that much. There we go. Yeah, you can, you can set statuses for it and manage the incident. Um, once this is once this first level is um, put in, a lot of these sorts of features are going to be added. Where you do like um, map, you put things on a map, and you can then you can use that big TV that I was talking about, that 52 inch 4K TV, and put things on there. So uh, that's that's pretty much it. Um, uh, uh, cool. So yeah, if you got any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, if you if you like, dude, this guy is horrible. He went up there and talked for like an hour, and like I fell asleep. Like you can tell me that too, uh, and I won't be offended. Believe me, I won't be offended. I, I get told that all the time. It's all right. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, that's pretty much it. So, thanks. All right, we're gonna take uh, a four minute four minute break, potty or food or whatever. And uh, at 8.20, we shall have Charles up with our first lightning talk.
Also, forgot to say since John might be heading out, thank you, John, for presenting. Yes, yes. thank you for driving out. Okay, how are we doing? Everybody can hear? I'll make sure to knock this off my pocket at some point just to add a little bit of flavor to the lightning talk. If you haven't seen one of my talks already, if you haven't met me, my name is Charles Yost, Charles L. Yost on Twitter. It's really easy to 
get a hold of. I don't have any of that information on here because it's a lightning talk. I'll be throwing things at you afterward if you have good questions or if I thought you were particularly attentive. If you fall asleep, I will throw hard things at you just because it'll be funny. Everybody ready? Yeah. Ready. No, too bad. <laughs> Fail to ban. Prevention software. Port attack. Just soak it in. It's going to be a slow paced, fast paced lightning talk. Yeah, it's going. It automatically advances. I don't do anything. How many left your SSH port open on the internet lately? I figure I'll give you time to take in the awesome internet memes that I scrabbled for. I, my meme being is not as on point as Alex's, but hopefully still good. Prevent intrusion. Your server will thank you often. Ignore useless noise. Anybody got that? No? Okay. <laughs> Written in Python. Always good stuff in Python. Even works on three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you was on it. Next, next presentation. Oh, limerick. The limerick would not be appropriate for the audience. Sometimes we have kids here. Monitor your logs. Block brute force attempts. <laughs> and how? With IP tables, of course. If you've been to my other talks, you know this is very uncharacteristic of me. If you're going to go for it, go for it, right? <laughs> Only SSH, you say? Not so great, except it has support for many. This is definitely what you expected when you came tonight. Right? Apache, Exim, Counter-Strike, Asterix, PHP, MySQL, more. Setup is easy. Package manager has it. Apt install, failed to ban. I couldn't find an apt meme though, so gotta deal with the Pac-Man one. Next, the config. It is easy as can be. Edit the text. In etc, fail to ban. Log lines are filtered. Frequent connections are jailed. Custom actions chain. Whether you realize it or not, you guys are getting excellent education on how to use fail to ban. I have no idea if I'll put these slides up or not. I'll try, probably. Most important thing, whitelist your IP address or feel the ban on you. If anybody has questions, sneak them in in between the haikus. No? Okay. Fail to ban client. Many possibilities. Read the man page, fool. And I couldn't find a Mr. T meme. Google Foo let me down. Probably oh, yeah, gets just as good. Yeah. Any questions? No? Start, stop, reload, and status, to name a few. But the wiki has more. Twenty seconds apiece? You can make it email when filter or block. What a neat trick.
do not forget this. Distributed brute force attack will still make it in. Also, and Janine, you were the one who identified him as Haikyuu's first, or just spoke up, either way, so you get to pick. What would you like? They are socks. The socks, excellent. Others exist, but I like this the best of all, the many choices. Hmm? Used monitor fail to ban? What others exist? What, what else would you use to monitor it? Vision agents, now in Linux flavors. But if you have to know them, then some are deny hosts, stockade, and OSSEC. Thank you. I mean, that's what I do, right? Yeah. <laughs> we also released Mac OS version. Deny hosts is the one you want if SSH is only concern and focus. Stockade is only for the BSD in you, which I do not know. <laughs> OSSEC is more than simple log filtering and blocking bad guys. And I won't make this one go the whole way. Anybody have any questions? No? No questions at all. Anybody have any comments? How much does it cost? How much does which one cost? Fail to ban. Fail to ban? It is free! Yes. Zero, zip, zilch, nada. Alex, you had a question? Is there anything you share for the features and benefits of your vision product? Absolutely. Some other time, because I'm out of time. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully, you were at least there, everybody.
I mean, this is going to be the most time consuming part of the latest deck, is connecting the computer. That's a cool idea to have a different format. Source found. Charles is really good. Source found. Win! Did you write a bucket of stuff? Can you see Osman? No. Do you want to? Um, I want to see Alex. Can you see it now? No, I I still see the um, science logo. in the morning right now. Cool. And what time do you have to be up? Um, I need to be at the airport at the latest at 8.45. So, so thank you for joining us. Just Woo! There's a switch there. <laughs> Glad to uh, virtually be there. So uh, somebody from uh, Ohio told me to, um, that there's a thing in Ohio where uh, if I say OH, you guys know what to say? I yeah. Did that come through? Nice. Hey. <laughs> that wasn't very enthusiastic. Well, this is not a, not a sports it? crowd. This is IT. <laughs> so, right. oh. so, so, Wimpy, you just uh, real quick, just tell us a bit about kind of what you do and, and what your role is with ISC Squared so that uh, all the five people here can get an understanding. Okay. Um, so, what, what I do for, uh, for a living is I'm an uh, independent security consultant uh, working out of Belgium, basically. Uh, traveling the world, um, trying to fix security, just like you can do. Um, well, that's awkward, awkwardly close. <laughs> um, in, in, in my spare time, I'm also sort of a, a fan of fan of Alex. Um, and when it's to IC squared, uh, people, people have to understand that I'm not paid by IC squared. So I'm, I'm a volunteer member. Um, I am on the board of directors, and we basically set the, the, the strategy of the organization being like five years ahead, um, trying to understand what uh, the security profession will look like um, in that time frame, and make sure that we can support security professionals with the right uh, credentials, training, uh, information, uh, and community. So, so not to ask a leading question, but would you say that ISC Square has improved in the past year, the year or two? Becoming more relevant uh, today's security professionals? I've been on the board um, since 2012, uh, and in, in the past five years, there's been a lot of change. Um, I, especially on the board, um, the, the board has definitely uh, professionalized. Um, if you look at the organization uh, in itself, um, it was a very much a, a US focused organization uh, when I joined, right? Um, then after that, uh, the, of the Europe uh, with, with myself and uh, it has a, 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 a big voice as well. Um, and we started to create what we call uh, regional offices. So we have offices in, uh, in uh, Sao Paulo, we have uh, offices in Japan, in, in Hong Kong. Um, and we've been able to uh, those offices to, to act um, I wouldn't say independently, but they are able to uh, to shift their focus based on the needs in the region. Uh, so that, that allows us to um, to meet, meet the needs of security professionals um, around the globe uh, in, uh, in what I would say maybe a scared way. So, so what do you think are going to be some of the biggest challenges of the rest of 2017? I know that the uh, the year's kind of wrapping up. Um, so the, the, the first big challenge is uh, we've moved up our uh, election. I don't know if there's any IC squared members uh, in the room right now. Um, but I, I, I hope at least uh, a few people in Ohio are, are certified. <laughs> um, so the 
the elections are actually coming up next month. Uh, in the past, it was always in December, uh, but we decided to move up the elections to um, August because that allows us to bring the uh, new, newly elected board members uh, to the Q4 board meeting uh, to ramp, ramp them up uh, more quickly and to not lose time between the Q4 board meeting and the Q4 board meeting. Um, so the, the, first, the first big thing that the members have to pay attention to um, is the election and make, make sure that uh, you vote for the right people. And I can, as, as a board member, I can say who's the right people are. Um, the second thing that's coming up, uh, I think, uh, also very important, is our first independence uh, conference in Austin in September. Um, and it, I don't know if people are familiar with the IC Square uh, Congress. It, it used to be um, side to side with ASIS, which is another uh, organization that's most, mostly focused on physical security. So, anybody remembers anything about sprinklers? Uh, uh, fire extinguishers, um, fence heights, whatever went to the exam. Um, those are the people, uh, is, 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 are the people that are uh, focused on that, that part of it. Um, this year is the first time, first time that we're running um, IC Square Congress alone. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then hopefully uh, welcoming the new board members uh, and um, keep taking hands with, uh, with people like Dave, Jennifer, Michala, uh, Kevin Terris, uh, and other members. Outstanding. Let me ask you, I have a question for you. Is for me or for IC Square? For you. No, just for you. This is for, for you. So uh, uh, what's the difference between security and compliance? <clears throat> Are they the same thing? Wait, I, I, I was about to ask that question. At <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, they are <laughs> <Okay. laughs> No, they, for, so to, to, to answer your question, uh, for me they are not the same thing. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, um, compliance is a byproduct of security. You, you create a secure infrastructure and secure organization first. Uh, and compliance should be a price, uh, byproduct of that. If you focus solely on, uh, on compliance, uh, you won't get there, but solely focusing on security won't make you compliant either. So, you know, I think one thing that I've, I've just heard a bunch of times in the past few months, from your people, they've told me that if you're compliant, you're probably not secure, but if you're secure, you're probably compliant, which I completely disagree with um, also, because I think that they're very uh, separate. What do you think so about that? Uh, I, I think I, I think I agree with you. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, audits and any um, governance oversight uh, organism that you, uh, has to be compliant for uh, is another threat in your uh, threat level. Uh, not being compliant will uh, result in fines, uh, will result in extra costs. So they should be just part in, uh, of your of your threat level. When do you come into Ohio? You moving here. I'm I, I'm moving there. I was uh, I'm gonna marry uh, Amanda, so that's gonna be my dream part. And then I'm, no, uh, I, I I think it's about three years that I have to stay married to her, and then um, I I will be American and I will live freely in in Ohio. That's the plan. <laughs> uh, I, okay, I don't know. Okay, uh, I, I have nothing to say to that. You're not moving in. Okay. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions for us? That's probably a better question, so we can change the subject. Yeah, I had, I had a question for you. The, um, the first thing I wanted to ask, um, especially about your uh, exceedingly good looks, um, <laughs> in, in, your, in, in your daily life, uh, or in, in, your, in, in your job, are they a blessing or a curse? <laughs> I, so I think, you know, so I guess I didn't introduce myself. So I work at Trusted Sec, um, been about four years. So I'm a consultant, as you can guess. And, and a neat and tidy and professional appearance is very important. Is that what you're asking about? Because <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't wear a t-shirt to a client, right? But, but, um, but <laughs> that's a really good question. Well, you, since, since you like to call me at 5 in the morning on FaceTime, remember? <laughs> so you know what I look like when I wake up. So. Laker. So, so the, what's that? Without the makeup. That's it. Well, I mean, that's it. We I mean, can go into that topic if you want, because you've seen pictures of me with makeup. I look much better. So, 
So but, but on a more serious note, does anyone have any questions for, for Wim while we have him on the phone? He's not someone we get to talk to every day. So yeah. Yeah, what's one thing we can learn about Belgium and what kind of beer do people prefer in your neighborhood? What and, and do you just call them waffles or do you say Belgian waffles? <laughs> no, we just call them waffles, yeah. All right. All right, no, okay, so what kind of beer do people do people drink beer there? I know Europe's a really big country, so it's probably varied. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to know about Belgium is that we throw a very awesome uh, uh, conference uh, with Brucom. Um, other than that, um, I, I think we're uh, very good as far as uh, food goes. You can see that. Um, at my my physique is not um, that fit. Uh, it's the good good food in Belgium. That's the, um, that's the ideal uh, male form right there. I don't care what anyone you say. That's the that's ideal male performance right there. <laughs> um, and what, what was the last part um, of the question about beer? Yeah, yeah. The question yeah. was, what do you drink beer? Or what kind um, of beer do you drink? Um, I'm I'm actually a, a fan of the of the sour beer. So um, if, if you're familiar with the um, a brewery called uh, uh, Cantillon. Um, that, that's my that's my favorite beer. Do you import U.S. beer? No. Like is that what you drink if you're hoity-toity there? Like like you drink yeah, Budweiser? Miller. Uh, Actually, <laughs> That's a reasonable question. I mean, that's like. Do, do, do they have any, any security or IC squared questions for William? Will we have him on the phone? Where do you see IC squared in uh, five years? You, where do you see IC squared in five years? So this, this is where um, I, I, won't, I, I won't don't touch that question. Um, where I see I square within five years is definitely without me. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not trying to make this uh, my, my life's work, uh, but I, I, I really want to set up an organization that, um, uh, that's successful, right? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of thought uh, nowadays about a sh shortage of uh, people security people. Um, or information security professional. Um, but we're also talking about how, how can we bridge the gap between uh, the, the technical security world, so, or the security world in general, uh, and management the, the organization, right? Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, we're not gonna solely focus on, um, on educated training uh, and certifying security professionals, uh, but we should also focus on um, getting security content into, into other degrees, into uh, other professionals. Because um, more than security professionals, we need professionals with security knowledge. And that, that, that's what I think I swear that in the next few years we'll start focusing on. One of the things that we will be introducing um, for IT Square members first is uh, what we call micro, micro credentials, uh, where so this, this can be a really long answer. Um, one of the one of the critiques that uh, the CIDC always gets is that it's very general. Uh, the problem with the certification I, uh, like the CIDC is that it is that it certifies a professional, right? Um, and that professional is is very broad. It can be a CISO, it can be a reverse engineer, it can be a pen tester, it can be uh, um, so somebody working in a stock, it can be somebody um, analyzing malware. Um, the profession is very broad, so the, the CNC is very general. Our micro credentials will delve deeper into, se um, into separate topics. So there will be uh, a micro credential towards uh, penetration testing, but also uh, data analysis and, and all parts of the information security profession. Um, and, and the second thing I think we will be focusing on is. Uh, it's part with uh, with other organizations. Um, in that sense, as I expert knows that there are uh, very good certifications, very very good um, teaching materials out there uh, from from other organizations, and we are not um, focused on uh, reinventing the wheel. Um, we we want to make sure that uh, that our members have access to um, the information that they need to get their job done, whatever their job within the information security sphere is. Now, I'm going to put this down for CPEs, and if it gets audited, that will be hilarious. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Wait, no. Eh. No, go ahead. I'm, 
class oh, uh, so, so, so any event that you attend uh, that runs longer than an hour, uh, one hour is one CP. So if you put this event um, in, in, into the CP um, registration engine, and we actually just uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, launched our new website today. So it should be uh, looking a little bit more modern, a little bit more clean, uh, and more features will be rolled out in the, in, in the member um, section as well, um, just as an aside. But in any event, even if they are not uh, submitting your CPs for you, any any event that runs more than an hour, uh, you can submit uh, for CP. Can you FaceTime If I FaceTime you, does it count? Amanda just asked. What? If I FaceTime you, does it count for CPEs? That was a question from Amanda. That was not my question. Uh, no, but uh, write, writing a review of uh, Amanda's book uh, definitely counts for CPEs. <laughs> All right. And that book has one of the best technical editing. It's one of the best technical editing I've ever seen. Would you agree? I've heard, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, does he see uh, require certifications for licensed professionals in InfoSec just like we would a lawyer or a doctor or other things, at least by the upper management or director or, or, or whoever in charge? Did you catch the question? Um, a little bit. I think it was uh, around license, licensure. But if you can repeat the question, that would be helpful. So the question is, do you, do you see uh, required certification, much like a doctor or an, uh, uh, an attorney or something like that, uh, for especially for upper management around information security? They could the just regulatory. Like regulated. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, so first and foremost, I'm, I'm not a fan of uh, licensure. Um, I, I've never been supportive of it, but it's, uh, it's a topic that comes to, um, that comes on the table um, a lot, actually. Um, Countries like um, the, the UK, um, Australia, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan are pushing uh, towards licensed security professionals. Um, just recently, the, there is an organization, uh, and I think the, the Cybersecurity Association in Singapore um, has released um, a press statement around uh, licensure for security professionals. And it will focus first on uh, penetration testers and in the incident responders. Um, so that's definitely coming, and it's something that IT Square is focused on to be at the table with uh, um, when those talks are, are happening. You also see it, see it in uh, the Department of Defense, where you have or still have 8570, uh, which is due to be replaced with, uh, um, I think it's 9140, um, that will also uh, put requirements for uh, people that want to perform security professional uh, tasks in um, the Department of Defense. Uh, so it's definitely a topic and it's something that IT Square um, wants to represent the uh, profession to make sure that those regulations are, are sensible. Perfect. So I think we're, we're running out of time for us. Any, any other questions before we kind of close it up? Yeah, David Lauer. Do you have a CISSP? No. And I'm terrible at tests. Okay. 500 multiple guesses. Oh, oh okay. So did, did you hear the question? Yeah, Any chance of changing the test format? Okay. Just, explain um, that. I, I, I will explain that, yes. To so something where you could, what, interview out of it? Yeah. Where you could interview out of, like, you could get credit for parts of the test by being interviewed by generals? Like, well, or, like from the Army? Well, the radio, it's a general <laughs> class. Oh, like from a, like a ham like a ham radio. Yeah. I don't know if you have ham radio there. Yeah, they do. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I don't know how radio waves work. The Belgian ham radio. Uh, so, um, as far as being exempt of certain uh, certain parts of the of the test, um, that will not be possible. Uh, what we are ruling out is uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, adaptive testing where in the beginning you will get a lot of uh, random questions across uh, different topics, uh, but then as the, the, the test basically learns um, how good you are in certain topics, um, if you are, for instance, bad at, uh, at, at crypto, uh, you will get more questions about crypto to make sure that uh, your knowledge in that area is validated, whereas if you show proficiency in another topic, uh, you will get less um, questions of that. Uh, the, 
Amanda says the Security Plus used to do that. Um, I don't know. I took the, I took the CISPA paper. So, um, again, I, I can talk for hours about uh, about this thing. Um, the, the second part we're uh, rolling out, uh, just to finish that, that part of the end, uh, is um, uh, scenario based testing. So instead, instead of just uh, getting multiple choice questions, you will be presented with scenarios um, that will, um, oh, where you need to, um, just as a simple example, you need, you need to place the firewall in the, in the right location. But that, that's a stupid example, there will be more complex uh, scenarios presented um, to the people that take the test. So basically, now, keep your CPEs up so you don't take that thing again, is what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're like, that's my thing. I'll keep paying those, so I won't take it again. Now, uh, if, if you look at the history of the um, um, CISSP testing, uh, there's always been a lot of uh, commentary that I Square was not doing computer-based testing. Um, the, the problem is that uh, I Square, and since a few years, um, Stances and C Council as well, um, are anti 17024 uh, accredited, which is another ISO standard for professional certification. Uh, and organizations like uh, Peer View that we are currently part partnering with and other uh, computer-based testing facilities uh, can not provide the uh, security required by um, ISO 17024. So we were not able to do uh, the computer-based testing. Uh, because of that standard, rather than uh, I square not, uh, not being willing to do that. Um, and then the um, last part I want to say about testing, which I think is important to know as well, is that basically every test is uh, analyzed by uh, what they call psychometricians. Uh, and they analyze every question, see uh, how many people answer it uh, uh, right, how many people answer it wrong, but also how many people uh, that, that pass. Um, answer the question right, and uh, how many people that fail answer the question right or wrong, right? Uh, and all, all, all that analysis um, is meant to, to create cre create an exam that is that is fit for uh, a student. There's actually a lot of work. Perfect. So, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, so, so one thing I do want to cover, which we're not going to cover tonight, but I did want to talk to you kind of about in the future, if we were doing no one of these is about kind of the, the differing regulations, you know, between the U.S. and, and some of the South American countries and, and Europe, et cetera, um, and just you know where we see down the road that going, and, and you know how can we comply with all these things that are slightly different uh, without it being a complete nightmare. But obviously, we're not going to get to that tonight because we okay. to, but, but unless you, unless wants to be here for like two more hours. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep an answer uh, to that question for uh, for the next time. Perfect. I'm happy to come back anytime. So. Oh, perfect. Well, it's, we, really, I, we really, really appreciate it. We all love you. So at least I, I love I, you. I can't speak to everybody. But. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So this, this, is, this is now um, earning me a signed copy of Amanda's book, or? Uh, when, when, are you, when are you in the States? Yes, I'm When are you in the States next? Um, I'll be in, well, uh, Austin in September, and um, I think I'll, I'll be downtown. in uh, Virginia in October. You say Austin or Boston? Uh, Austin, Texas. Texas? So, okay, the birthplace of America. So do you, um, <laughs> is, that, is that for a board meeting? Um, no, that, that, that's for a uh, group conference. Oh, okay, well, I'll sign it with Dave if he's going then. Okay, awesome. I'll probably get to sign it myself, though, just FYI. <laughs> it's going to be a signed copy. It's going to be a fantasy signature. I, I look forward to it. All right. Have a great night. Safe, safe travels. Thank you again. You too. Bye, Take care. Bye, William. Thank you.
you, uh, Jack, do I know how to wear a mic? Yeah. Are your slides set to auto advance? No. Okay. But I, but I, I hope you hold me to time, because that's my number one goal is to be 400 seconds or less. I'm going to uh, hold you to time. I mean, Thank you, sir. Okay. So just jumping right in, I wanted to ask you something. Have you ever felt like um, you're in a room with a bunch of people and you care about security way more than everybody else in the room? Most days. Yeah. Yes. Does anybody have a situation like that they can share? Every meeting. Uh, Every meeting. Executive briefing. Rock on, I'm with you. Uh, how about, have you ever had clients that are uh, really cheap? I actually had a guy call me the other day and say I need a cheap pen test to get a checkbox. I sent him to this guy's website who had pen tests listed for $4,000. Uh, have you ever, uh, you know, made a really good pitch based on merit and function and exactly what your network needs to your, your manager to get some kind of next generation defenses and they shot you down and you're a little stuck trying to defend your network with stone knives and bear skins? that ever happen to you? Uh, have you ever had to do with uh, users or people who just couldn't care less about security? How, how does that make you feel? Like you're a government employee. No, <laughs> <laughs> kind of burnt out, maybe uh, disenfranchised, maybe that your, your craft isn't being valued. Um, we don't want to be this guy. That, that's what not to do. Uh, if anybody remember Die Hard 4, uh, there was a security analyst or somebody who worked for the government that continuously informed the government of these critical infrastructure vulnerabilities and was continuously ignored. So he decided, I'm just going to attack and wipe out the government with the fire sale, you know, taking out infrastructure, communications, electric grid, data all at once and hold it for ransom. So to hear it, what I'm here to talk about tonight is to say, hey, we don't have to do this. We don't have to go down that hole. There's a lot of other ways to go about this, right? So, um, so one idea is, you know, maybe we should go... It's a free country, right? If the people we're hanging out, working with don't really care about security, maybe we should start going talking to people who do, right? Obviously, we're here tonight, but I mean, in the work form, maybe we talk to some people who've uh, been through a breach, right? There's a ton of companies who've been breached. We get more companies breached every year. Chances are, in LinkedIn, you can find somebody in your area who's worked for a company that's been breached, and they'll probably talk to you. Um, go talk to some sectors that are spending money on InfoSec, right? Uh, this from the SAN spending trends, uh, finance, by far and away, spending more than anybody else on InfoSec. So probably there's some people in finance who care about security. Maybe it'd be good to talk to some people in that sector. Um, and then, you know, kind of knowing who the stakeholders and influences are. One of the things I was really surprised about is how in this, you know, survey, business unit managers and CEOs and a lot of other folks were being the influencers and spenders of InfoSec, much more so than I would expect security architects and, and so such. So it's kind of eye opener, right? So, when we feel, you know, kind of like burnout out that nobody cares what we're doing, we can go find places that can take better advantage of our, of our talents. Um, another thing you can, and, and you know, there's, you can also look at where growth is, right? So we just generally don't get ahead by going with what's slow and stagnant, but what's growing in the economy. So you can find a lot of data about that. Another idea that you can do is um, try to think about some ways you can apply your cyber super skills in other areas or non-traditional careers or growth markets, right? So like green energy, like marijuana is growing right now, like gangbusters, apparently, uh, illegally in Colorado and Nevada and some places like that. And there's a ton of money, uh, so there's a ton of risk. So probably there's some stuff that can be done in that area. So, you know, one idea is to go and find out where people care more about cyber. Another was to go and try to figure out what's new. How can you get ahead and break out and, and kind of lead the way? And one of the things that I would challenge you guys to do is to think about this. If you've ever been in a startup or looking at a company that's going to go public, if you, look, if you look at the uh, price to revenues ratio, companies that cater to the higher pyramids, higher end of Maslow's pyramid of, of needs are priced way higher than customers that are just building assets and providing services. So try to think outside the box a little bit, not to be too cliche. Um, there's a lot of other things we can do, right? Um, for some of us, we don't want to be workaholics, so we want to have a life outside of work, and maybe our fulfillment comes out outside of work. So, um, you know, there's a lot of great uh, folks in our community right here in our neighborhood that participate in these groups that uh, contribute to open source projects that advance electronic communications freedom, uh, or maybe volunteer their skills at an organization that serves the community. How about, you know, if you've got that Palo Alto firewall sitting at home, you set up a VPN service for your friends and family so they can have intrusion prevention on the go and some other things like that. You know, what can you do that's a low-hanging fruit right in your backyard and you know, how can you 
get to film it that way, right? Um, the other thing to think about is that um, we're all different, right? Diversity and, and uh, variety is the spice of life. It's what makes life worth living, and it's what makes organizations strong, countries strong, is having diversity. So it's okay that now everybody cares about security. I mean, that's what we got us for, right? And above all, chill out. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. Thanks. Amanda, you ready? Six minute primer on Wireshark. All right, so anybody do networking or have ever used Wireshark uh, all, like, all the time that probably don't need a primer? All right, well, you can just ignore the next six minutes. Um, this is just going to be about filters and how it helps you in certain attack situations. Um, I've used it a lot in uh, CTFs looking for flags and for you know, in attack defense scenarios when other CTFs, other CTF teams are attacking you. Um, you can use it in your every average day of a NetSec person uh, to look at all of the traffic that's going over an interface. Um, so this is a network capture of me doing directory traversal from one box to the next using Nikto and also doing an nmap scan to that box. There's a couple different things that you can use as a standard filter to kind of look through all of that packet data. Um, because right now there's, you can't really see all the way on the bottom, but there's 67,000 packets in this PCAP. Can't really look through that one by one. Um, some stuff that you can look for, so uh, right here. So this is directory traversal with Nikto. You jump on a Kali box and run it, or you can download it separately. Um, it goes through all like normal open shares that could be on a web server um, that shouldn't be open. Um, and one thing that you can look for is this HTTP request URI. And you want it to contain this hexadecimal thing. And that's just ASCII for dot dot slash. So if we look for that, and here, it better show up, there we go. Uh, this is that directory traversal. So you can actually set alerts based on this, and that will kind of, I mean, if somebody's going to a directory with a dot, dot, slash, it's still gonna show you that. But if you see a lot of them at one point in time, you know, somebody might be crawling your website. Um, putting that out there on the internet as, a, as an alert really isn't something that you want to do because everybody's always crawling your website. So next one up would be, I uh, skipped all that. Uh, there's a couple nmap things you can do depending on the kind of nmap scan that you run against the host. Um, this one for sure works because it's looking for um, directory traversal, right? So it's going to try and look for port 443. And you can put this filter in. And it's going to show you the one packet that Nmap sent looking for port 443. Um, 443 wasn't open. That's probably why it stopped at that point. There was only one port open, which was 8,000. Uh, so there's only the one packet there. Uh, all four of these are pretty common uh, Nmap strings that you can look for in Wireshark. Um, there's another packet capture that I have. Let's see if it opens. Wireshark was killing my box earlier. So. Yeah. So this. Oh. 
is one that I used uh, FTP over. Everybody says, you know, it's bad to use FTP. Well, because everything's clear text and you can see usernames and passwords and what people are doing over the wire. And this is what that looks like. So you can look for all FTTP stuff. So there's my user, <laughs> stupid FTP guy, and my password. Um, you can see I tried to request anything star.txt, and it came up with test.txt, which I also received. And it'll pretty much tell you everything that goes on in that entire FTP transaction. Um, this hasn't been really useful in CTFs, but it's definitely good to not do FTP for these reasons. Because it tells you size and a whole bunch of other stuff in the packet as well. And one that I like to keep for CTFs. Uh, and this isn't going to work because I don't have anything that contains flag, or at least I don't think so. Um, you can look for TCP contains whatever you want. You know, it could be server name that you're looking for. If you don't know what field that is in, and you know it's going to be in a TCP packet, you could just look for whatever you want for TCP. It's probably not going to show anything, but might as well try. That's what it looks like when nothing comes up. Um, you can also use regex strings in there if you want, if you know exactly what the, t what the um, CTF flag is going to look like. Um, I've caught other people pulling flags off of RVMs with Wireshark. Um, so you can say, oh, you know, they have a script that are pulling flags off of this directory. I know I need to go and lock that down. Um, it's really helpful for defenders in that way. And you can also look for SQL injection. How much time is that? 30 seconds. Sweet. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Can I be Are you running that as root? Next <laughs> yeah. Are you running it as root? Uh, <laughs> what? Wireshark. Wireshark. Wireshark, probably. And it's a Mac, probably. <laughs> all right, that's all I got. Thank you. Jimmy, you ready? Hi, I'm Jimmy Bird. I work at Binary Defense Systems, or Binary Defense, I don't know, we're kind of changing our name right now. And I'm going to talk to you about .NET Core. Um, so this is kind of a programmer thing, but I kind of want to bring this up because this is going to be something you're going to start seeing in your networks on your, uh, all over the place. Uh, hopefully this thing is actually going to auto -incom. Okay. There we go. But Jimmy, you're a bird. How, how do you talk? I don't know. Like, wh why are you telling me about this stuff? I can't believe this. This is a, a programmer coming to talk to me? All right, look. This is something that's going to start coming up. Programmers will start using this, and you're going to start seeing this across your network. So let's talk about a little bit, just like, why would we want to use this? Because it's going to be something you're going to see. It's going to be this again. It's, the, it's Java. It's, it's, it's going to be all over your place, and you probably want to be able to figure out what's going on. So kind of like how uh, Java is, it's supposed to be like a cross-platform kind of compilation that's going to work across, your, or across a bunch of different types of machines. So it's going to work across OS X. It's going to work across Linux. It's going to work across Windows. And it's going to be um, something you're seeing a lot more. And so I'm just going to give you like a little bit intro of like what you want to start out with. So you can just download the tools. It works across so the, the .NET the developer tools, work across Linux OS and Mac. And so you can actually go ahead and start like pulling them up. One of the first things you want to actually end up doing is uh, start it out. And so I'm going to start saying, hey, let's use this with F Sharp because I'm a crazy nut and I like functional programming. So this is how this is the command you would run to get yourself a new uh, project. 
And so this gives you a scaffolding, so it allows you to say like, hey, here's my project file, here's my uh, code file, and then you're able to do things with it. Um, the first next piece thing that you actually want to do too is be able to do .NET restore. You have to call that immediately after. Basically, this goes out and looks for dependencies that you're going to need to, it pulls them down. So if you're familiar with like NPM or um, you know, if you're familiar with how like cheat shops work with Python or uh, Ruby, uh, what gems, kind of same thing. So it's going to pull down your NuGet packages and restore those for you. Then you're going to want to end up building it, and commands are pretty simple right here, right? It's just going to go ahead and compile your code. Cool, that's the fun, right? That's the coolest thing we want to do. Now, after it compiles, you're end up going to run it. So what the running does is just it takes your compiled code and runs it through the .NET program. So what's kind of interesting about this is it spins up a couple processes and it's kind of interesting to watch the tree, but it's, it's still in like the dev tool space. And so you're going to see like the .NET process pop up and you're going to start seeing things under it running. So I would say definitely when you run this, also look at like your trees and figure out what's going on in your process space. And then you end up with some, hello world, now you're a .NET programmer, everyone's happy, yay, you've done it. So, cool. That, that's just kind of gets you like, hey, this is what you're gonna do to get your standard hello world project, right? So now you actually can see like, hey, let me start playing with this. And if you're a really good developer, you're gonna wanna write, end up writing some tests. And so you end up wanting to pull your, dot, your test framework in and do the same kind of, kind of thing. You're gonna wanna be able to do the .NET restore, and do the .NET build, and there's gonna be another command that's coming up would be .NET test. Cool, whatever. So, again, why am I bringing this up? This is a security talk, right? So, we've had the .NET framework around for quite a while. It's got a lot of interesting exploits in it. A lot of interesting. If, if you look at Black Hat, there's gonna be a few talks on certain exploits, especially in Java and .NET. Um, and so now that .NET's going to be a little bit more cross-platform here, we're going to start seeing these kind of exploits possibly creeping into OS X or Mac OS, whatever they're calling it these days, and into Linux. And so a lot of these uh, malware authors I've been seeing have been doing a lot of ransomware in .NET. Isn't that kind of, it's kind of a weird thing, right? And so what's interesting also is you can publish any of these console programs as like a native binary to that platform. And so, like I said before, it looked like it's .NET, but now I don't actually have to have .NET on my machine. I could actually probably target my malware for different platforms and come up with a native binary and put it on your machine. And so, again, how's it different from the .NET full framework? Well, it's a little bit, it's a little bit smaller, it's a little bit more lightweight, but now I can actually do cross-compilation really easy and target a whole bunch of machines. So. Start kind of looking like what's what's going to happen with some of this stuff coming out on my network. And also, it's going to be a little bit different from Mono. Mono is kind of a full framework on Linux because it's Mono is a full framework on Linux, so it does kind of the same tries to implement the same things, but it doesn't do the same thing as like .NET Core, where it's going to be able to really um, it's trying to be more lightweight and be able to do a lot more different things with it. And so, again. <laughs> Anything I can do, I can do this maliciously. So I can make my programs that look like they're pretty cool. I'm gonna make them look like uh, they're actually not doing good things to your network. And so if I take, um, like for instance, .NET Core, PowerShell runs on .NET Core, right? Well, guess what? PowerShell is on Linux and Mac now, right? And probably typical users aren't gonna pop this up, but a lot of your developers, especially if they've kind of been in the .NET space for a little while, might actually have this in there. And you know, sometimes PowerShell is very specific to Windows, I get that. But you're going to start seeing probably a lot more things start getting geared towards this again. That's why I'm, again, just trying to bring this to your front of your mind. If I can make this XPlat mal malware, if I can make some malware that runs on .NET and works on Windows, and I can kind of just do some tweaks and make it work on OS X and Linux, well, it's going to be a little bit of a problem, right? So, again, just wanted to bring this up, so just keep getting in your front of your mind that this is coming out, this is this thing that's happening. Also. They do have a bug bounty, so if you're more on the, the red team, you want to do some extra penetration tests, you find some vulnerabilities. They do have some, do have some pretty decent payouts. Um, with that, any questions? Has there been much active work on using it for like evasion, for like you know antivirus evasion and not obfuscating like a triple shot or something? Uh, using it, is, has there been any use for evasion? Um, not that I've really seen. Um, I'm supposed to play. I don't know if it's a good Yay. 
Um, I, I don't know, it, it's still, it's just gonna be like another uh, executable, right? And so you can do all the standard things that you wanna do, flip bits and make, you know, SHA's different. And I, if I find your private key, I'll sign with it or whatever, right? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, but it's still gonna be like, it's gonna be a thing that's probably gonna start seeing more of these things popping out. And you'll probably end up seeing like DLs, DLLs getting downloaded um, to like OSX or uh, Linux. So you kind of be like, why, why would that be happening? That's kind of weird. So start, maybe you wanna start having like Yara rules looking for DLLs, those kinds of things. Uh, any others? Cool, thank you.